Can you feel the cold? It's in the middle of February here in Sweden, in cold, cold Sigtuna. And there's nothing else than drinking some mead that really can warm you up. Because I'm a Viking, and drinking mead is the way that I deal with the cold. Warming myself from the inside out. But let me tell you, there's one place right now where it's not that cold. In the far distant land of the Anglo-Saxons. A big war is going on. The war between the Norton men and the Anglo-Saxons. And let me tell you one thing. If there's something that the new patch 1.3 Corvus has shown you, it is really that the Vikings are superior. Hughes people, I am 30 and welcome to this new patch video on the patch 1.3 Corvus here in Crusader Kings 3. Are you excited? I am excited, because if there's something that this patch really is, it's something big. Of course, it's not only a patch, it's actually a content flavor pack as well, called, call, I think, the Norton Lords, which really is about the Norton Lords, as I said in the intro, the Vikings. As I am broke, I haven't been able to pay these six or seven dollars for that new DLC, so I can't show you in, in really in inside the game what that patch is, that update is about. But I'm still going to talk about it as well as the patch 1.3 Corvus in itself. So stay tuned as I go through the big major points. That this new big patch and flavor pack has added into Crusader Kings 3. So let us start with the new flavor pack, Northern Lords. And as we all may know, Northern Lord is focused on the Vikings, the Vikings here in Scandinavia as well as Denmark, the Scandinavia. It really showcases all of this area, but this really only this peninsula. So let me watch in the patch note what this really does. So for example. The first thing that they talk about is we have new coat of arms that changes whether or not you are pagan, be meaning a pagan viking as we can see here, or if you're not pagan. I think that is actually a rune in itself. I don't recognize it, but I think that's a rune. So there are new coat of arms for the pagans. There's also been new religious icons for the pagan religions if you try to reform the Asatru, the pagan faith. There are also some new buildings for the Pagans, which I can't show to you right now because I don't have the DLC itself. But that's something that you need to keep in mind if you buy it. There's some new buildings. Focus on Scandinavia as well as Eastern Europe. Let me see as well. There's also, as they say, this is a smaller thing. If you have the new notifications, you can actually dismiss all of them by right clicking. But that's not the important thing. I'm going to focus on the Norton Lords. And one thing that it has done is has changed the number of baronies here in, uh, in Iceland. So they, they have increased the number of, of baronies in Iceland as well as here in Scotland. I don't know if it's something of the patch or if it's something of the DLC, but I think it's something of the patch. So that's something that should affect you whether or not you pay for the game or not. And they also changed the number of counties up here in the Sapmi region. And I can see that it's something that has to do with the patch itself and not with the DLC. So there are more counties up here in Sapmi, which is the northern part of Sweden, Norway and Finland, as well as Russia. Let me see. Then we have, of course, the big... When I've gone through those smaller things about the... DLC, I think this also they have added some new things, some new events. For example, you could go on an adventure if you know about it, which is something you can do as Viking. Um, I think there's some extra new events as well, which has to do with you being pagan or being more or less a Viking. So there are some events connected to that, as well as like new clothes, new hairstyles and beards. I think they added like one beard. 
for example. So there was a new flavor to being a Viking in this new patch. And that is enhanced, as by I said in the beginning, with winter being added to the game. So as we can see, it's in the middle of the winter here now in Sweden. It's the 20th of February. And we in Sweden, as you can see on this interface, we have winter severity normal. So winter is now something that you have to keep in mind. So you have mild winters, normal winters, and harsh winters. And they will increase or decrease the amount of supplies that you use. Which means you will be able to have more casualties while fighting in the winter. As both Napoleon and Hitler were very soon to find out. And as a defender, you have an advantage by fighting in the Winterland. There's also a Winter Soldier Commander trait, which enhances your fighting in the winter. Makes sense. And there are also some men at arms that are better or worse at fighting in the winter. For example, Heavy Cavalry, of course, is not that good at fighting in the snow. It does make sense. Okay. Also, a new big thing as well, except the winter, if you go on. It's the new dueling system, and that is something that we had in Crusader Kings 2, if you ever played that game. You could basically go up to any person and you could duel them. I don't know if we can do it, we can offer him a concubine, which is something that is new as well from this new patch. You can offer concubines to other people. You could also duel people, and I think it's actually a trait which gives you the opportunity to duel people, if I remember correctly. The Stalwart Leader, if we can find it. It should be here somewhere if it actually exists. This one. May challenge rivals to single combat inflicting stress if you win. So we can actually duel people. That is something that we had in CK2 and it's now also in CK3. They have also added a new poetry system. You can become a poet and you can actually make poetry. So that's something that we also had in CK2 if I remember correctly. And the most fun part about this, you can see the poetry that you write, but you could also use this poetry to torture people. So if you, someone is kept in jail and you read them your worst selection of poetry, and that's basically torture, because if we, if we have ever listened to or read bad poetry, you all know what I'm talking about. It is physical pain that you gain by doing that, those kind of actions. Because bad poetry is really bad for you, let me tell you. Let me see if there's something else that we can go through. Not the big ones. Okay, we keep on going through the patch notes. We had the balance patch notes. Men at arms, special troops, and mercenaries now have time travel. Time travel. What this means is that we can no longer teleport our men at arms. I don't have any men at arms right now, but if I hire some, if I hire, it also actually goes with merc mercenaries. If I hire some mercs, can I hire some? I don't have the money. If I hire some men at arms, the cheapest ones just go for anyone. Bowmen. And I raise those. It's actually too few of them. We have, we have, we have to just let the game run for a while and get our men at arms back up. The bowmen. It's gonna take a while we're losing the. We're actually winning the war in the background. There we go. So, we raise these bowmen. They should actually come here, but it doesn't actually happen immediately. Okay, so it takes time to raise your men at arms, which has changed. And if you try to teleport them, it will actually take longer if you try and raise them far away from your capital. So if I try and raise them here, it should take longer, as we can see, one month instead of five days. So that's something that has changed with the new patch. So you can no longer teleport your men at arms to basically cheat your opponent and kill them using the man-at-arms. That's something that I actually think is good. They also revamped the Dynasty Legacies by changing, um, if you can look here, the cost of taking different, uh, of those different things. And they also changed them slightly to make them more balanced. Because as it, the game was when we started, blood was the thing that everyone went for. But it seems like they have nerfed it a bit, potentially, I don't know. What I really try to do is make the other ones better to make them more balanced. You, just, you don't have to just go for one of them. It's a dynamic cost to basically go for the new Dynasty Legacies. 
as we can see here, becomes harder and harder. It increases by 500 and noun each time. Okay, let me see these other big things. There's a lot of text to go through, that's why it's taking some time for me. Um, your grandchildren and great-grandchildren should no longer wander off, following the same rules as children. That's something that's good, because it's very hard to keep your family in peace when everyone walks away. It makes sense. Okay, siblings now inherit ahead of parents. That's something that's new. You said that. Um, the witch coven modifier now gives disease resistant rather than health. That is a big change if you ever want to go for a witch to get the witch coven. So you don't no longer get the health by itself. You get disease resistance, which is, in my opinion, much worse. So they have basically nerfed. The Witch Coven. Good to know. Uh, let me see those other things. There's a lot of things in here. Feudalizing as a tribe no longer requires all tribal era innovations. Now you only need 70% of all civic and military innovation. So if we look here, adopt feudal ways. I need 70% of all military and civic tribal era innovation. And that numbers up to nine of them. So I need nine innovations, then we could actually feudalize. So they have made it slightly easier for you to feudalize, and you can feudalize quicker, which is good. Let me see. The stoning culture now starts with longboat innovation. That's something that we can actually check, so they have longships, because they're basically Vikings themselves. Although in a slightly different way. So, good on you Estonians. I feel happy for you. They also did made some changes to the AI, trying to make the AI work out, work slightly better than they did before. That's something that I see as a positive thing, because sometimes the AI do very stupid things. Um, all vassals are now able to declare war, no matter how deep down in the vassal tree they are. Interesting. Good to know. Um... No longer avoids, avoids a river crossing if it will be a defender in the following combat. Um, okay. Will prioritize adjacent targets when hunting nearby enemy units unless a target further away is at least four times bigger. Also interesting to know. They have also changed the interface. As I mentioned in the beginning, you can take away all of the notifications at once by right clicking on it you dismiss everyone. If you left click on notification, you only dismiss that single notification. So if you'd right click on them, everyone will go away. That's amazing, because sometimes you get so many notifications that it makes you feel really, really stressed out. At least in my opinion. And they also changed a bit with the... What do you call them? The, the interfaces that pop up here. I don't remember the specific name that people call them by. It's going to make it slightly easier for them to actually notice when you're trying to take them away. And it, they're going to, it's basically trying to stop you from moving your armies if you have them selected while trying to take one of those away. By, by right clicking. Because that happens to me all the time. I try to take away one of these pop-ups and I manage to basically order my army to go somewhere up here. Which is something that is really, really annoying. So I'm very thankful that they have changed that. Thank you, Paradox. Let me see other things that are interesting. I'm not following a script. That's basically why the reason why I'm still reading. Because there's a lot of things to read through that they have changed with this patch. And if you're interested in, interested in everything that has to do with the patch, I'm going to link the patch notes, patch notes down in the description. So make sure to check that out if you want to know about the other changes to the game. I'm only trying to go for the more bigger ones, of course. But there's a lot of things that they have changed, and if you wanna, you're interested in something specific, go in there and watch. I think that's going to be good for you. They fixed some grammar, which is not really that important. Um, some basically some bugs they have changed as well. Um, let me see. 
They also changed slightly. Dead HRE Empress now have the Reichskrone on in the portrait. Only Empress with the HRE has the primary title weird at Krona. A very small change, but I like that one. Because I like to go into the basically the title history and look at the people who have owned those things before. I do enjoy that, especially when I'm playing as the Romans. Because if you do that as the Byzantines, of course, you can see every single Roman Emperor back to the age of Augustus, if you didn't know. That's something that I do enjoy, actually. Uh, let me see. Localization. Nothing that interesting. All formerly inaccessible relig religious clothes headgear are now accessible in the barbershop. You want to wear the Pope's hat and step pagan robes? Go right ahead. This is something that I have to test myself. Can I wear the Pope's hat? Let me see if I can, actually. Does the Pope hat have a specific name? That's what I want to know. Temple head wrap. Ecumenical patriarch. Yeah, the papal tiara. You can wear this now as a pagan. I can be the Pope myself. As well as wearing clothes from the step. So I'm a step commoner with the papal tiara. That is actually amazing. I know it's terrible, but it's actually amazing. I love it. Thank you, Paradox. That's something that I didn't know that I wanted, but I do enjoy it very much right now. Norse houses now have access to a wider pool of motos, focusing on their many gods. Deceitful characters can reference Loki, Brave Ones, Thor, etc. I don't really know what this means, but I think it might be some kind of event thing that is based on basically which god your house is focused on. Uh, com especially with con considering like how your character is. Um, added a few new death reasons for berserkers to execute in battle, such as cleaving people in half or viciously dismembering them. Dismembering them. Very interesting. Um, when offering vassalization to a feudal ruler, you may now offer a more lenient contract to improve their chance of accepting. Let's try this. So if I go for a Jaldum, we are of course, we, that's actually a duchy, a chiefdom. Offer vassalage. Hmm. This should work then. You may now offer a more lenient contract to improve the chance of accepting. That might be something to do with the flavor pack, because that's not possible to do right now. That's a high chiefdom. That's a chiefdom. I can't change anything about this. How do you even do that? I don't even know. But okay. A feudal ruler, of course. A feudal one. I need to find a feudal ruler. That's a petty kingdom. I need to find a fuel of one who is actually not far too far away to interact with. So let's be smart about this. If we go to play as a Byzantines and you are feudal, we can actually do this to make it easier to make them to accept it. That's actually very good. I like it. But to make it slightly easier for you to actually go by the diplomatic route instead of only conquering every single opponent that you fight against. So that's a smart thing. I like that. Thank you, Paradox. Um, let me see here. Change the Dior Vassal modifier and offer Vassalage interaction to Rightful Vassal for balance and clarity. Um, added a narrative event for converting to a new fate, as well as a notification for when your leech converts to a new fate. Thank you for telling me that my leech changes fate. Sometimes those things happen and you don't know about it and you get surprised every single time. So thank you, game. I like that. Replace Tengrism's Sky Burials tenet with Warmonger, which is more accurate for the time period. Okay. Rulers with an active wow of poverty now wear appropriately drab clothing, regardless of rank. Drab clothing. I guess that's something... Basically like commoners clothes or rags, which does make sense. 
Your head of faith and religious peers will not care if you found a holy order. Thank you. Because I have wondered for a long time, why should I even get a holy order if I don't use it myself? Because I'm too strong to use it. Why should I found one? Because I don't get any opinion or anything with anyone by founding a holy order, which doesn't really make sense. So thank you for clarifying that paradox. Thank you. Jacob's pet rock stolen by parties. Oh no, I think that's a joke. Add a decision for independent Norse rulers to have the realm embrace local traditions. I don't really know what that means. Norse name nameless now uses standardized old Norse spellings and contains significantly fewer late period Christian names. Norwegian name list updated to the same plus various older Christian names, so they've changed the names when it comes to Norse people. Which does make sense from a historical standpoint. William the Bastard is now clean shaven as per Ro Norman tradition, thank you. Um, made more lands in Eastern Europe pagan on game started in 1066. Added a few more baronies to Scotland, as I told you before, as well as in Iceland. Many important and significant holdings such as London, Alexandria or Baghdad now start the game with additional buildings already constructed. Okay, so if we go to Baghdad for example, which is somewhere in this region it should be, I can't... There is Baghdad. They now have some buildings in Baghdad. Thank you. That might be only been in 1066, but they had some buildings already of this two years. Uh, let me see. Overhaul the Bernie Lay of the Sapmi as well, I said that. The Abbasids now had the capital in the historical capital of Samara in 867. That's not Samara. That's Samara. They might have changed it when we started, I don't actually know. They might have changed it. But they're supposed to have the capital in Samara, according to the game. Good to know. And just a few ones. They have updated the counties in Italy as well as in Croatia. So Italy is not as useless as it used to be. Thank you, because Italy is actually very has been very underpowered when it comes to the amount of baronies for such a small king, such a big kingdom, really. They have done the same here in the Balkan region as well. And they also updated the traits of Robert of Apulia and his son Bohemond. And then they have done some small bug fixes. And that's everything that I think that I'm going to go through today, guys. So, as I said, I only went through those things briefly and it still took me over 20 minutes. That shows you how big this new patch is. There's a lot of new content added into the game, and make sure to check it out both in the link down in the description as well as inside the game, because this could be fun guys. And if you pay for the flavor pack as well, you're going to have that extra content when it comes to the Norse. I haven't paid up for it yet because I'm a student and I'm broke, so I can't pay those $6 for it. <laughs> I might do in the future, it all depends guys, because I want to play it as well. I love the Norse, I'm Swedish, so I love the Norse, I love the Vikings. So that's something I might do in the future. But make sure to like this video if you have enjoyed this. Also make sure to subscribe to the channel to support me as a content creator as well as to keep you can keep up to date with my current and newer uploads in the game as well. So thank you for watching guys. So have fun in CK3. See you soon. Take care.